Good evening. Good evening. I'm going to continue our uh, study this evening on the book of uh, Genesis uh, as it pertains to creation. And we will also be examining some, uh, some theology of the theory of evolution, uh, spontaneous generation, abiogenesis, uh, and we'll be comparing it to the creation model that we find uh, in the Bible. How about we start off with uh, prayer? Ernie, could you lead us in prayer, please? This evening as we come together, Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have to come and have money talk to us this evening. Hopefully he brings us something that would be beneficial and help us to understand your will better. We pray for the classes that that are going on, that uh, each one will have a, a successful evening. We pray for the community around about us and those people that uh, are seeking the truth, that they'll see the uh, air and the ways that come unto you. This time we also pray for those who are sick, who been on our prayer list, and the many that we know about. Whatever the issue may be, that we pray your healing hand will be upon them and uh, your wisdom will be there for them to be able to go to you in prayer and ask for help. I pray that you will be with us throughout this evening, throughout our lives. In our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so let's uh, remember our objectives to help build our faith, uh, to answer questions, and to understand the importance of the book of Genesis. Uh, once again, three of the most uh, studied and the most uh, attacked narratives of the Bible are uh, the creation model, the worldwide flood, two of those, both those are found in Genesis, and then the resurrection um, of Jesus. <clears throat> and so uh, it's, it's pertinent to uh, Christianity, it's pertinent to uh, defending our faith. All right? <clears throat> Genesis, so we'll just do a quick review. Genesis, the book of beginnings. Does anyone remember what that word Genesis means? Origin. Origin or source. Remember we went through uh, and looked at 14 different uh, origins that we find in the book of Genesis. The origin of life, the origin of universe, uh, the origin of language, the origin of culture, the origin origins of uh, nations, the origin of the uh, hydrosphere, um, uh, the origins of, uh, I'm trying to think of what I went through, I don't want to repeat myself. I'm trying to remember them all. But there were 14 of them, different origins that we find there um, in the Bible. And so it's an important part of the Bible. Without, um, you know, without the book of Genesis, we wouldn't understand uh, the New Testament um, properly. Now, Genesis is foundational. It's properly placed, I believe, at the very beginning of the Bible since, it's given, since uh, it, the word Genesis itself means beginnings, origin, or source. And so it's foundational uh, to the Bible, and it's foundational um, to our faith. And so we find in Genesis the origins, right? And, and no, no, other, uh, uh, no other document uh, gives us uh, such a detailed explanation for the origin or origins uh, of life or of the universe, so on and so forth, right? Uh, the, Bible, the Bible has, uh, in Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, uh, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, have made some uh, pretty assertive claims there that have stood the test of time and the test of science. So Genesis is a book of beginnings. It tells us what we are, right? Who we are, how we got here, why we are here, right? And it's important that we understand that. You know, the you, young people today um, I feel bad because, you know, I see the memes on Facebook that say, like, they show pictures of, of uh, you all seen this, they show pictures of, uh, of of the church building Sunday morning, right, and, and over half the pews are empty, and then they show the football arena Sunday afternoon, what? It's packed, right? <laughs> it's packed, right? And it's something to the effect of, well, we wonder why there's such a moral decline in the country, right? When, we, when, we're, when we're more concerned with entertainment than we are uh, 
education or spiritual matters. Um, and so we lose a sense of who we are, why we are here, what's my purpose on the earth. You know, some, so many young people today uh, become uh, disillusioned with life, dis disillusioned um, with the, uh, I'll say vicissitudes, remember that word, uh, the unwelcome circumstances of life, right? Become disillusioned with the unwelcome circumstances of life. And we wonder, you know, why are we really here? What is this all for? Because if I get to the end of my life and it's just you're dead like Rover, he's dead all what? All over, right? Then it seems, what's that word Solomon used in Ecclesiastes? Vain. It seems like it's in vain, right? Meaningless. Right? It's all meaningless and in vain. And that can lead to some, some, some rather uh, you know, peculiar behavior. I know I mentioned this before, but you can read on, online the, uh, uh, the writings of Eric Harris. Uh, he's one of the, one of the individuals that, of, of the Columbine shooting. And him and his, uh, him and his uh, accomplice, and, you know, they were very disillusioned with, with being and with life. Right? They're very confused. They didn't understand why they were here, where they came from, or what the purpose is. Yeah. And so Genesis gives us that. All right, we looked at also uh, the single law of chance. Um, Emil Burrell, there's a, there's a crater on the moon uh, named after him, the Burrell Crater, if that sounds familiar. He stated that events whose probability is extremely small never happen. All right, the probability. What's the probability of me rolling a six on one on, on one, one dice? Huh? A, a die, right? On a die, okay. I don't, I don't roll die or dice either, so I'm sort of, I, I, that caught me off guard. I was trying to think. All right, so what's the probability of me rolling a six? One and six, right? And so that's, that's kind of how uh, probability, um, probability works, right? You factor in, uh, you put in different factors into an equation, you know, people use it all the time. They bet on sport, sporting events, right? And they use, you know, what's the probability of uh, the Patriots beating the Steelers? Pretty good, Pretty good isn't it? Right? <laughs> <laughs> Don't bet on the black and gold in that case, right? Yeah, the probability of them, it's pretty high, right? And so we use probability in a lot, a lot of things we do, in risk. It's how we manage, we manage risk. All right, so Emil Burrell stated that events whose probability is extremely small never happen. If the probability of a certain event happening in the universe is less than 1 in 10 to the 45th, it's not 1,045, it's 10 to the 45th power, which is a 1 with how many zeros behind it? Does anybody remember? 10 to the 45th power is a 1 with how many zeros behind it? 45, 45 right? 45. And so we don't know what that number is, a Brazilian, I don't, we don't have a name for a number that big. And so, you know, that's, that's how we write these out. Uh, so it's a one with 45 zeros in it, behind it rather. All right, so human beings intuitively categorize, I'm sorry? So you said? I'm sorry, I said excuse me, I was first. Oh, okay, all right, no problem. <laughs> sorry. That's all right. I thought you were asking me something. All right, human beings intuitively categorize that event as so unlikely that we consider it to be an impossible event. All right, we consider it to be an impossible event. There's the, <clears throat> there's the one, I will put the one with 45 zeros behind it. Now we looked at um, Carl Sagan, who is a prominent atheist, and we looked at also, I believe it was Richard Dawkins who calculated the probability of evolution and of spontaneous generation, and that was a one with, one of them was like 10 million zeros behind it, one to the, 220 million power, and one was one in to the 10 million something. All right, so that has a probability of what? Of zero, right? All right, and so we're, we are addressing this, and we want you to know these things because, um, because uh, some of the laws of science are being taken advantage of or being stretched, right, and, and, and manipulated, right, to continue a narrative. Um, so when people ask me, well, why do you believe that God created the earth? One of the, one of the reasons I give them is, well, mathematics. What's the probability? What, what are the other options? And what's the probability of those options, right? 
just the simple math of it alone renders it, gives it a possibility of what? Zero, right? Now those aren't our calculations. I didn't put those on here tonight because there's so many slides, but I have the other references, you know, with the other, with the other uh, uh, Carl Sagan's um, uh, reference with the, with the probability he figured out, right? So those are atheists' own equations that they came up with, right? These aren't equations that are biased because this person is a Christian, right? Okay, so the single law of chance, that's what we looked at also. Um, we also looked at this question, who created God? This is often a question that's asked um, to kind of stump Christians, who created God? What's wrong with that question? Or what's the answer to it, I should say? Who created good, God? I think a good answer is what God told Moses to say to Jordan, I am that I am. I am that I am. I am that I am. The ever-present God. He was always here. Always here. All right, so this question assumes that God is affected by time, space, and matter. Uh, and so we looked at, in the beginning, in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Right? Time, space, and matter had to come into existence simultaneously. Right? If you had time and matter without space, what's the problem? Where would you put it? Right? If you have time and matter with no space, where would you put it? If you have space and matter without time, when would you put it? Now, Gary was here last week and he said he remembers in high school and his wife also that they were taught that matter always what? What is it? Existed. Matter always existed. That matter was eternal. That was what was taught by, by a majority of the scientific community at that time. Now, that all changed with the discovery of uh, or the invention of the, um, um, I don't it's not, I know it's not real, the Hubble telescope, right? And so they looked out in the universe and they saw that the universe is expanding and the gal many galaxies are, uh, seem to be moving away, you know, uh, expanding. And I thought, well, it all must have came from one spot. And then, of course, we started uh -oh, the Big Bang. Uh, but in any matter, we'll get, we'll get to more of that later. Uh, time, space, and matter must come into existence together. That's what we see in the very first verse of Genesis, right? In the beginning, that's the time. God created the heavens, space, and the earth, matter, right? And so he, in the beginning, the time, space, and matter, God existed outside of them. In order to create them, he had to exist outside of them. So God has always been. Are there any comments or, on anything? All right, I know this is a bit of a review, but like, uh, what's, a, what's the Penn State wrestling coach's name? Remember his name? Kale Sanderson? Kale Sanders? Yeah, yeah. So they have, they have a great, you know, wrestling program, and I remember um, he was being interviewed in the wrestling room, Ernie, and, uh, and they want to know the secret, right? Because he's, by the way, they won, I don't know, seven or eight championships what in the past 10 years something like that right and he wanted what's your secret what's your secret well, he had a chalkboard there and he turned the chalkboard over you know what it said on it it said repeat like a thousand times on it right repeat 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 what are you saying is that's what we do we drill we drill we drill it over and over and over and over and over again that's a secret until the muscle memory it just becomes automatic right it just becomes automatic um, and so, and so that's something also that, that I know I have to do. I know my, um, the way I learn, I compare it to throwing spaghetti at the wall, right? And so the more spaghetti you throw at the wall, the more sticks, right? And so that's, that's how I kind of view how, how I, how I learn. But at any rate, all right, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, time, space, matter coming into existence at the same time, right? The Bible makes sense. I'm always reminded when I hear these things of Marshall Keeble and him saying the Bible is right. The Bible is right. The God who created time, space, and matter must dwell outside of them. All right. So the question, where did God come from, is assuming a limited God. All right. First Peter, verse chapter three, verse fifteen. Uh, some of the this this translation says, "But in your hearts, revere Christ." Your trans, if someone's using a uh, New King, a King James version, it says, 
but sanctify the Lord God in your heart, right? Is that what it says? Who's using the New King James and who has it? Does anybody have a King James version? Do you have a King James? Do you want to grab that? And then who has the New King James? Someone used or or, or something of or some other translation that they would like to uh, share. But in your hearts, revere Christ as as Lord. I know some of my, I guess I should turn there in mind. I guess I have a new King James, and well, I'm asking you all. I guess I should, maybe I should turn the lights on. But sanctify the Lord God in your heart, right? But, and that sanctify means to set apart. Right? Set apart the Lord God, the Lord God uh, in your heart, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. How many, how many of you have ever been asked to give a reason for the hope that is within you? How many of you have ever been asked that? I've never, I've never met anyone who has, right? How, has anyone ever asked you why you believe in God? Yeah. Yeah. What are they asking? Give me a reason for the hope that's within you, right? That's what, that's what they're asking. A lot of times, and I thought, he said, hey, well, nobody's ever asked me that, so I don't have to answer it. Well, they don't ask it verbatim as we see it here in Scripture, right? Were you going to say something else, brother? Well, they went on to say, you know, what, what, what made you decide you wanted to be a Christian? Christ? What are they asking you? Give me a reason for the hope that's within you, right? Why? Yeah, why? All right, right, exactly. Right here in 1 Peter 3.15. How else can this question be phrased to you? Why are you a Christian? Why are you a Christian? Why do you go to church? Right. Why do you go to worship? Actually, an accurate, more accurate statement. Why do you go to worship? Anyone else? How else can this question be phrased to you? Why do you think you should be saved? Why do you think you should be saved? Anyone else have anything else? All right, so people are going to ask this question or try to get, want this response from you and, and they're going to ask it in, in, in different uh, in, in different ways all right but we we should have an answer uh, to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear all right why do you believe in god i'm going to ask you right now who wants to share why do you believe in god or why do you believe well here's another way to say do you believe this is the word of god right Absolutely believe it. Why? Because there have been many people who tried to disprove it and by doing so actually became Christian. Okay, exactly. That's a that's a very yes, that's a that's a that is a that is a very accurate um, response. Right? The integrity of the Bible. It uh, it has survived, you know, uh, thousands of years, right? Uh, God's word has survived. Jesus said what? Upon this rock? I will build my church and what? Shall what? Not prevail against it, right? The integrity of the church, God, Jesus, of His work. But if somebody doesn't believe it, then that puts them in a whole different place. They don't believe the Bible at all. Yeah. You have to get them to believe it. Sure, yeah. And that's part of, you know, uh, you know what Peter's talking about here. You know, giving and give me a reason for the hope that's within you. Yeah. Well, I go back to Genesis 1-1 one, one, and I say, all right, well, I look at, I look out, let me, let me go this way. I look out in nature, right, and I see design, I see purpose, right? I see order, right? Where did it come from? Where did it originate? Well, either God created the heavens and the earth, or He didn't, right? Either there is a God or there's not, right? So what's the probability then? Or sometimes, sometimes the best evidence is, 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 is the opposition's evidence, right? Uh, you know, if you look at, well, there's the creation model, and then there's the evolution model, right? And so we can look at the evolution model and say, well, is this, 
Is this probable? Is it, is, it, is, it feasible? is it feasible? Does it make sense? Is this what we see in nature? Right. And that can get people to think about, you know, either God created the heavens and the earth or he did. What are the other options if there is no God? There isn't anybody comparable that could have done it. No, definitely not. Um, and so these are some answers you can give. Uh, um, I think Gary said last week the, the historical accuracy of the Bible. Uh, the, one of the answers get, well, we can look at the the uh, uh, the prophecies that are given in the Old Testament. You know, the Bible was written over a period of 1,600 years, right, by over 40 different writers. A lot of them never knew one another, right? But yet, when you when you read the Bible, everything fits together perfectly, right? And they don't contradict one another. Right? That's 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 an evidence for uh, for the uh, for the integrity of the Bible. That's evidence that the Bible, as it says in Second Timothy three sixteen, is God breathed. Right, the inspiration of the Bible. That's why partly I would hope. You know, there's also the psychological aspect of the Bible. You know, I remember when I when I became a Christian, one of the things that struck me is I was uh, I was about thirty four years old, right? And I'd, I'd really made a mess of my life. Like, I really thought I was going somewhere, and I really wasn't. And uh, I had made a mess of my life. And I remember I was, like, leafing through the Bible. And I got Isaiah, um, Isaiah chapter 17. Boy, I hope I'm right. No, let's see. Let's see. Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 17, right? You know, it says that God's words like double-edged sword, right? Come through bone and marrow, right? Get straight to the heart, straight to the sword. Now, I remember reading this Acts in Jeremiah chapter 17. You know, you don't always feel so like with it when you're like 34 and you're moving back into mom and dad's house, right? <laughs> that's not a good, that's like, you start feeling like, you know, like, hey, I'm doing something wrong in life, right? You know? And uh, so that's kind of, that's not, it's not kind of, that was the position I was in, you know? Um, and you know, back in your old, back in my old room, and you know, I had had my own business in Florida, had been very successful. However, you know, I made a mess of, of things in my life. And I remember reading here in Jeremiah chapter 17, 19 and 11. You know, God's word has a psychological aspect, a psychological sword that comes with it, that gets right to the psyche. Or you know, that word psyche is 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 part of the root word soul, right? Right to the soul. Uh, the heart is deceitful above all things. Uh, in verse 9, and desperately wicked, who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart, I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings, as a partridge, now here's, now here's the part that caught to me, right? As a partridge that broods but does not hatch, so is he who gets riches, but not by what? But not by right, right? It will leave him in the midst of his days, and at his end, he will be a fool. Yeah. That that hit me, right? That hit me like, a, you ever had something just hit you like a bunch of bricks fell on top of you? Right? That hit me like a bunch of bricks fell on top of you. Right? Everything that I thought I had had left me in the middle of my life, and at the end, he will be and so the Bible has a psychological aspect, you know, that, that can that can cut right to the heart of things. And so these are things that we can give uh, people an answer. I'm flipping that thing. They give people an answer for the hope uh, that you have uh, within you. And it says we need to do it with gentleness and with respect, right? Are there any comments on that? Anything? All right. Um, Richard Dawkins, who's the author of um, The God Delusion. It makes this statement. The fact that life evolved out of nearly nothing um, some 10 billion years after the universe evolved out of literally nothing is a fact so staggering uh, that I would be mad to attempt the words to do it justice. All right. Um, he's, he's authored several books. Like I said, one of the ones that stands out is uh, The God Delusion. Um, and so... Uh, as science uh, makes new discoveries, right, a lot of things that, that, that we thought were true and accurate aren't. 
Now remember, we determine science through experiments. They usually start with, uh, with, with a hypothesis, right? And then it becomes a theory. Theories and hypothesis are loosely based on evidence. Theory has more evidence than a hypothesis, right? But through a series of experiments um, and through trials and so on and so forth, uh, science makes determinations. Very rarely do the science make a law from experiments and so on. Now we have like the law of gravity. I keep hitting that button. We have the law of gravity, right? Uh, you know, uh, we looked at the, the, the law of chance by Emil Borel, right? So these things are well studied and very rarely does science um, make, a, make a law. But science is, is constantly changing with new discoveries. Like I said before, it was always thought that matter was eternal, but with, with advances in technology, found out, well, there is a beginning. There was a beginning to the universe, right? And so scientists had to conceive what the Bible had said in Genesis 1-1, that in the what? In the beginning, right? And so they had to concede that point, and now they're conceding another point. Somewhat. The fact that life evolved out of nearly nothing some 10 billion years after the universe evolved out of literally nothing is a fact so staggering that I would be mad to attempt uh, words to do it justice. All right, so now physicists are declaring that the universe, the world, what we see around us, all started with what? Essentially what? Yeah. Came from nothing. All right. What do you think the probability is of, of nothing coming, oh, of something, I'm confusing myself. What's the, what do you think the probability is of something coming from nothing? Zero. Zero. That's a probability of zero. Scientifically speaking, it has to have a probability of zero because we've never witnessed it. There, there's no experiments that we can do or ever going to do that is going to prove that something can come from nothing. All right, so it has a probability of zero, speaking scientifically, because science needs to be based on evidence. Yes, ma'am. I just heard not maybe a week ago that something was three billion years old. So where did how did they get that? Three billion. I'm not sure what you're referring to. Three billion. I can't um, remember. I what believe I believe the number that that's most consistent with with the age of the universe. Going back to the beginning of time, is 45 billion. Okay. And so what he's saying here is that uh, is that in the beginning there was basically nothing, right? That, that's what they say. But what they're not telling you is they can see that there was space, right? There was an empty space, or this empty space or expanse has been here. Uh, how fast does light travel? Anyone know? 186,000. What? Kilometers, right? Kilometer per kilometers second. per second. Well, now, now, they use kilometers because of miles per hour. It's like 670 million miles per hour. Hmm. All right? Um, so in, in one second, if you moved at the speed of light, you could go around the, around the Earth seven and a half times in one second. Seven and a half times in one second if you moved at the speed of light. Uh, in our galaxy, uh, in our galaxy, we're like at the, so if you consider like a galaxy like a record, remember the big the, the, the record, I don't need, everybody knows what a record is, I tell my nephew that he doesn't know what a record is, <laughs> a record, right, if you put the needle in the middle of the record, right, if the record was the galaxy and you put the needle right in the middle of the record, right, that's where we're at in our galaxy. At the center, so to get to the center of our galaxy, where the needle, where not the needle, but where the record goes on the player, right? It's twenty-five thousand light years. All right, twenty-five thousand light years. That, that's that's uh, a light year is how long or how the distance that light can travel in a year. Now, moving six million miles, six hundred seventy million miles per hour, how far do you think light can go in a year? Pretty far, right? 25,000 light years to the center of the galaxy from where we're at. And 25 light years to, out to the outer rim or the edge of the record. That's just in our galaxy. That's not the universe. Right? So traveling at the speed of light, it would take you 25,000 years to get to the center of our galaxy. That is amazing, isn't it? So that it that is in, absolutely amazing. Huh? When it says in the beginning, is that 45 billion years ago? 
I don't, I, I don't believe so. I believe that the, the, there's no way we can tell for sure. Uh, going by uh, genealogical records in Genesis, it'd be somewhere between six to 10,000 years old is basically what uh, biblical theologists, biblical scientists uh, age it at, according to the Bible. Uh, there's no way to tell for sure exactly how old the earth is. Carbon dating and whatnot, th that's not accurate. Okay, and it says the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Yep. So it could have been here longer. We're getting there. We're, we're going to get there before okay. before we end. Okay. <laughs> it's I'm it's sorry. coming. It's coming. That's all right. She's 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 there's like some kind of telepathy going on. Here, right? <laughs> I'm pulling out some cosmic energy from up here or something. Okay. And so so that that's all right. So the you know the universe is huge, right? And so all this is because of what they saw in the in the in the Hubble telescope that the, you, that the uh, universe is is appearing to expand. Right, they can film the universe and put it in reverse and see that it's coming in slow. Uh, one of the one of the little the little things in there is that they don't tell you is that actually the universe is expanding. It is accelerating in the rate that it's expanding, which which doesn't make sense to them because obviously if you put it in reverse, it all comes back to one ball, right? When you when you light off a firecracker, it explodes rapidly, but as it leaves the mass that it started. Does it accelerate or decelerate? What does it do? It decelerates, right? After the explosion, everything starts to decelerate. Well, the problem with the Big Bang Theory that, uh, that is not often uh, brought up is that the expansion of the universe, it is not decelerating, it is accelerating, right? <laughs> and so now there, I'm not gonna get it now, but there's some theories, some quantum mechanic theories on, on, on different forces that exist in space that are stronger than gravity, so on and so forth, so but anyways. Uh, and so, so everything comes from this ball, right? This little, this little ball exploded, boom, superheated. It was, it was basically nothing, it popped to the size of a grapefruit, right? And then, poof, it explodes, and through time, collects matter and that, and, and ultimately starts making planets, um, so on and so forth. So these planets, what he's saying is 10 billion years after the explosion, the planets are fully formed, then comes the little, my eternal stew. What's the eternal stew? Remember? The primordial soup, right? What does primordial mean? Do you remember what primordial means? Primordial, existing since the beginning of time. Now, the primordial soup, did it exist since the beginning of time in the theory of evolution. Think about, think about what I just told you, how it goes, how the process goes. Basically you have nothing that pops to the size of about a grapefruit. I don't know how they come up with this stuff. And then it's, it, it becomes superheated and explodes out into space, right? And so at any rate, the primordial soup or the eternal stew uh, which gives us the building blocks of life, somehow appeared upon the earth after all of this. Now, this is one of the uh, artist's illustration of possibly what the earth might have looked like uh, around this time. Ten, I've seen other uh, uh, artist renditions where it's black and there's, you know, there's like fires all over the place. It looks like California, you know, in the summertime. And so, uh, you, you know, what it, it there's no evidence to suggest any of that. Um, so th there are theories. There's a reason why it's called theory of evolution. Right? It's not the law of evolution. It's, it's just a theory. Uh, but at any rate, that's what he's, that's what he's saying there. So, so right here, 10 billion years old, then the primordial soup starts to stir or do whatever it does. And then, you know, so, so it's, then starts the, um, the single cell, the single cell that starts life, right? <coughs> All right. And so... And so that's what's taught, and that's what, he's, that's what he's talking about. So at this point in evolution, it's about 10 billion years old. So you've got 440 billion, no, 40, about 45, about 35 billion, I think 35 billion years, something of that nature, for life to evolve. So you would need that for evolution, right? Because evolution is a, is, a, is a series of slow processes, right, over a long period of time. And so you need that time frame 
for this all to work, right? Um, and so here's another reason for the long time frame. DNA, right? With I'm just going to pick a couple things out. There's lots of other things we could look at and study. Um, the DNA molecule. Once again, uh, with technology, new advances, comes new revelation in science, right? And so DNA is one of the building blocks of life, right? It can make, contains a genetic code, right? There's DNA in every cell of your body. You can fit thousands of cells on the, the head of a needle, right? On the sharp point of a needle, you can fit thousands of, if not millions of cells, right? And each cell contains DNA. It tells you, you know, your height, eye color, hands, arms, everything about you, right? Everything about you. In each, in each one of those cells, they say there's about six feet of DNA. If you, you know, you ever see the pictures of DNA, it kind of looks like a, a ladder twisted in a spiral. You ever seen those pictures, right? Right? And so there's, if they said if they would unravel that, in each cell, now remember, you can fit thousands of cells on the head of a needle. There's over six feet. There's billions in your in your body. There are billions of miles. There's enough. There are enough uh, DNA. There's enough DNA in your body to, to go around the galaxy. Now, how big's a galaxy? Right, twenty-five thousand light years, just to go halfway this way and another half that way. Right. There's enough of that DNA in your body to stretch that far. Isn't that amazing? Wasn't it David that says, I am wonderfully and fearfully made? I'm not saying he knew anything about DNA, right? And so, one of the reasons we have a long timeline for evolution that this technology that, that has brought forth um, these advancements gives us, allows us to look at DNA, right? And the complexity of DNA, right? The complexity of DNA. Now you have to remember the theory of evolution starts with chaos, an explosion and disorder. And it starts to, from, from chaos and disorder comes order and complexity. Right? As time goes on, things become more complex and more order ensues as time goes on. Right? So with the with the uh, with the the scientists now able to look at DNA, one of the problems is how small is the DNA how small is, is the DNA? Well it fits inside a cell. How small is a cell? A single cell. So they find out, well, a single cell is pretty complex, isn't it? This, this almost infinitesimally small single cell is so complex. So how many years would it take to get to this infinitesimally small but infinitesimally complex cell? Do you understand where we're getting at? Right, because evolution teaches that uh, that there's just one simple cell that began to evolve and grow more order and so on and so forth, okay? Where and did so, the cell come from? Huh? Where did the cell come from? Well, that's, well, the, it's the primordial soup thing and all that, all right? And so, and now we get to where we're at. Um, by the way, we'll look, let's look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 5. So how were, we, we as Christians believe that, uh, that God created the heavens and the earth. Now, how did he do that? If somebody tells you they're lying, right? It says by his word, we understand that. Other than outside the Bible, they try to give you some kind of scientific explanation. You're not going to know. Scientists are never really going to be able to figure out how the universe was made, so on and so forth. Hebrews 11, uh, chapter 1, uh, Hebrews 11, verses 1 through 3. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. 
For by it the elders obtained a good testimony by faith. We understand that the worlds were framed by what? By the Word of God, right? But it's by what? It's by faith and trusting in God's Word, right? It's not by evidence or something that we're going... We're never going to have the hard evidence, right? There's evidence that points to it, but there's no way... Let me, let me say it this way. You're never going to be able to absolutely prove it, right? Without a shadow of doubt, because the Bible says it's by faith we understand these things. So that the things which are seen... We're not made of things which are what? Appear. Or visible. Or appear, right? Which the things which are appear. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 2. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. God, who at various times and various ways, um, in times past, has spoken to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his son. Him is appointed of heir, heir of all things, heir of all things, through whom also he made what? He made the worlds, right? Through Jesus, God made um, the worlds. Uh, we'll uh, we'll get to look at that. All right, back to Genesis chapter one one. All right. Uh, <clears throat> once again, I'm just giving you some evidence as to why physicists are saying that the world, the universe, all came from nothing. It's because of the complexity of the single cell, that they find DNA in that. So obviously, if, it, if these cells are that complex, then how small was the first one? It had to be what? Nothing, right? Nothing, all right? So that's why they're saying, physicists are saying that we now must understand, they say it's a fact, that, um, that, that something came from nothing because of the great complexity of the single cell of a single cell, which they thought was very simple, right? But it's not, a single cell isn't simple at all, is it? It's incredibly complex, all right? Um, all right, in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, time, space, and matter. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. So as Emily was asking us about, the earth was without form and void, and, faceless was on the face, and darkness was on the face of the deep. All right, now we have the tel we have the uh, Hubble telescope. It goes out, you know, it can see uh, millions of miles away, right? And so they look, and, and you know, part of the reason they send it out is everyone wants to know if there's people out there, if something's out there, right? There's a, there's got to be something out there because it's such a huge expanse. Have they found anything yet? No. no. What do you see? These are some photos. What do you see? These are planets, galaxies, so on and so forth, right? Bible speak, the Bible speaking here that the earth was void and without form. It did not have the prop, uh, was not properly set up for life. When you go out and look at the universe, this is what you find. You find matter that is void and without form, not containing the essentials, the essential building blocks for life, right? That is what we see when we look out in the universe. The Bible says that Eve is the mother of all what? <coughs> She's the mother of all what? Living, right? Eve is the mother of all living. I'm not going to find anything in outer space. I believe that by faith, right? Because the Bible says so. I believe the Bible to be the inerrant um, word of God. Uh, let's look here at Genesis 1 1 as we finish. Up in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the and the earth. Uh, the word that is used there for God, Elohim, is a plural word for God. Genesis one, Genesis one, verse twenty six. Then God said, "Let us right, let us make man in our own image." Right. Uh, once again, showing there um, the Godhead. Uh, we see here in Genesis chapter one, verse two, the Spirit of God present. Uh, the Elohim, that is word used there for God. Uh, we look also in Genesis chapter 11, verse 7, at the Tower of Babel. Uh, once again, uh, God is saying, let us, right, go down in 11, verse 7, and confuse their language, right? Once again, the plural, the plural word um, for God is used there. 
Um, and also in John chapter 1 and verse 3, John, John, John chapter 1, um, verses uh, 1 and through, through 3 in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was, was, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things uh, were made uh, through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. So we have there at the beginning the Elohim, the plural word for God. And who was there? Jesus. God, Jesus, and, and the Holy Spirit, right? The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the deep. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1 and 2, we already looked at that, at that one. Uh, you know, uh, so we, we already checked that one out. All right. And last thing, in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the new earth. The word that is used there for created, right, is a special word. It's ex nihilio. Ex nihilio. What does that mean? You and I can make a lot of things, right? I was down in Harrisburg today driving around, driving through traffic, right? Oh, look at this mess. You know what I mean? I need to get back in the woods. I can't stand in the city, you know? And, and so it's like, uh, you know, I'm looking at all this stuff, right? I'm the only, where did all this, where did this come from? Like seriously, where did all this come from? Where did we get all these materials from? Where do we get materials for cars, for buildings, where? Through science. And Through science, but it all comes from, it all comes from God. It all comes from the ground, right? Look what we do with dirt. Look what we do with the earth. If it doesn't come from the earth, tell me where it comes from, because we live in a closed system. Hey, he shut that off. I'm going to put the red laser on. <laughs> All right, so we'll stop there. But uh, the Bible says there in Genesis 1 1 is ex nihilo, is that God created. Ex nihilo means out of nothing. That's what that means. Ex nihilo, out of nothing, God created the heavens and the earth.